Good morning. Welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we are going to be working through some uh, concepts and examples, looking at how we can approximate the supports of real structures in terms of the uh, pin, roller, and fixed supports that we learned about in our previous lecture. So again, in this video, we're going to be looking at how uh, we can take the complexities of real structures and approximate them um, in a, a pin, roller, or fixed support engineering model. So I want to do a bit of, again, I want to do a bit of static survey today. And today I'm just imagining sort of a a uh, grab bag, an assorted grab bag of various topics um, of statics, of various tools and topics of statics that I think are particularly useful when um, working through a structural analysis course. So the first thing to keep in mind, or the first thing I want to look at is um, structure idealization. So last time, as a review, we looked at three types of uh, basic supports. We had pin support, we had roller supports, pin supports, and fixed supports. And we explored last time what those represent. But at the beginning of class today, I just wanted to take a brief view, uh, a brief uh, moment to consider what these actual what these uh, represent in actuality. So let's first look at idealizing supports. And how do we go from an actual structure to our engineering models um, that we're going to use for actual analysis and design? So uh, models are very important for engineering um, in any kind of, in any field of engineering. I don't care if you're talking about civil, mechanical, electrical, what have you. Um, the, the real world is made of objects and systems that are very, very complex. And the only way we can do any kind of meaningful analysis or design is to make certain assumptions and generalizations and approximations that sort of boil down the complexities of the world into simpler systems that we can, act, can actually analyze um, with the tools, the mathematical and physics tools that we have available. So let's consider this uh, simple structure here. So I'm gonna investigate this simple structure here. So let's say on one side, we have a big concrete block. So on this side, we're going to have a big concrete block. And then on this side, we're going to have a, a very strong uh, steel column. And then between them, spanning between these, I'm going to have a steel beam like so. So let's say I have a steel beam like this, uh, something kind of like this maybe. And we could just say these are both W sections for ease of consideration. And this beam is simply resting on the concrete, uh, on the concrete uh, pylon or whatever you want, want to call it. And let's say it is joined to the steel column by a, what I would refer to as a shear tab, although that is probably a bit beyond the scope of this course. But uh, in terms of what a shear tab is, this is not a steel design course. That's a bit later in your structural education. For now, just accept that there is a plate. It is welded here. So it's rigidly attached to the column and then it's bolted here and here. And note this, so again, um, it, this beam is simply resting directly, just gravity loading, just sitting directly on top of the um, concrete pylon. There is no, uh, there's nothing securing it other than just the surface contact between this surface and this surface. And here there is a plate and it only connects the web. Now, if you're not familiar, um, if you can't remember the terminology for, uh, for W sections or I beams or whatever you might want to use, um, in terms of a W section, the uh, vertical plate is referred to as the web and these horizontal plates are referred to as the flanges. So just terminology review. So 
<clears throat> we have our basic layout here, and uh, this plate again, it's fully con it's fully rigidly connected to the column. Uh, I would say maybe it's like a full pen weld or something, or a very large fillet weld. But when it's connected to the beam here, uh, it is only connected to the web. This plate does not go all the way up. It is only tall uh, is only tall enough to connect to the web. It does not actually uh, connect to the flange at all. So. Let's think about what these, now you may already see where this is going, but uh, let's think about how, uh, how can we approximate this? So we have a fairly complex system here. Um, think about the kind of contact that you have between concrete and steel. Um, you get a lot of friction there. Uh, this connection, you have bolts, you have a weld here, you have a plate. I mean, this is a, a relatively complex system. Um, so how do so we need to have some way of simplifying or approximating this, and to do that we need to consider a couple things. So uh, in order to to approximate this, we need to think about how a beam fundamentally works, and this is going to be a bit of a review from mechanics. So how to approximate. Um, in other words, how does a beam actually work? So let's say you have a wide flange shape. Well, let's look at it. What, what does the bending stress look like? Well, let's just say the shear stress first. And if you remember back to if you remember back to basic mechanics, your shear stress is going to look something like this. A very small amount of shear stress in the flanges, and then a big jump once you go to the web and then kind of a parabolic shape, then a big drop, and then um, and then a reduction, a slight reduction, a great reduction as you get to the other flange, then a slight decrease down to zero. And then in the, uh, so this is shear stress, and then bending stress, assuming everything is remaining elastic, would be something like this, just varying linearly with depth. Um, bending stress, and this could obvi obviously go either way. Uh, we could have tension on one side, compression on the other, or vice versa, just depending on whether the beam is in um, is under positive or negative bending. That's uh, not relevant for today's discussion. So this is bending stress or flexural stress. So let's think about where stresses are maximum and minimum. Shear stress is zero at center. Oh, other way around, zero at edges. Thinking flexor here. <laughs> zero at edges or top and bottom. Uh, max at center. Our bending stress is zero at center. and max at top and bottom. And therefore, because of this, we can, we can often approximate the behavior of a wide flange shape by saying uh, shear is basically carried by the web, therefore shear carried by web. And uh, flexure or bending is carried by the flanges. Now, is this entirely correct? No. A web, uh, if you look at the, uh, or if you look at the flanges here, they do have some non-zero amount of shear stress, which means they are carrying some small amount of the shear force in a beam. So this isn't 100% correct, but it is generally correct, and uh, it is a reasonable assumption for uh, static analysis and design. Bending stress. It, yes, it is. Yes, it is zero right at the center, or well, more technically, the neutral axis. Uh, yes, bending stress is zero at the neutral axis, and if you have a doubly symmetric beam, that will be at the center. Um, however, there's plenty. There, there is still shear stress. There is still bending stress that occurs in the web. 
However, uh, it is a reasonable approximation to say that uh, the uh, bending stress in most of the web can be approximated to zero. So it is adequate then to say that uh, bending stress is carried by the, the flanges while, uh, flat, while shear stress is carried by the web. And that is useful, and we can use that then um, when idealizing our structure. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this. Make sure you, uh, you keep this in your mind because it's going to be important as we look at, uh, as we look, work through this. So again, we have one end of the beam. Oh, and I'm going to go ahead and label these uh, ends A and B. So make sure you have that in your notes. Uh, just end A and end B. And A is resting on the concrete pylon. Uh, end B is joined with the uh, web plate or the, sh uh, or the uh, shear tab um, to that rigid column. So next, let's continue. Let's continue moving on. So again, we conclude that the moment is in flange and the shear is in. Um, sorry, the moment is in the flanges and the shear is in the web. Um, now, let's see. Let's also compare. Uh, let's also look at the connection in detail. The the right connection, the connection B. So we have our W section, like so. And again, we have just a plate connecting them, connecting this to a column. And we have our column, like so. And I would say a reasonable assumption for, now I am making the assumption in this analysis that the column is uh, much more rigid than the beam. So can, you can, we can consider the column in this case to be much stiffer than the beam. Okay, so let's look at what kind of forces might be transferred through this connection. So again, I wanna consider what kinds of forces might be transferred through this connection. Well, this is a 2D problem. We're not looking at uh, any dimensions into the board. So there are really three different forces that might be transferred through this connection. We'll have an X force, a Y force, and a moment. And in terms of, I'm gonna label these uh, uh, right now, in terms of uh, just N forces, and I could call this one BY, again, this is N to B. So we'd have a BY, a BX and an MB. BX would be the horizontal reaction force, BY would be the vertical reaction force, and MB would be uh, the moment that would be transferred through this connection. Now, um, so what I want to do is, I to, now, it's, now, again, I'm not saying that, the, that this connection will transfer substantial amounts of all three of these. I just want to analyze and consider uh, whether it's capable of transferring substantial amounts of each of these. So first of all, uh, let's look at uh, BX. If I try to transfer force through this connection in the X direction, is that going to work? I think so. I mean, this, this beam is going to have substantial uh, axial capacity. If it's moving, if in a force in the X direction, we represent axial force in this beam. So uh, it should have substantial, it should be, so the beam itself will be able to transfer substantial axial capacity. Uh, the bolts will be able to carry substantial force in the X direction. And then the column, and then bearing on the column, uh, that force will be able to be transferred. So I, sh I will say that the X force, yes, is much greater than zero. There is substantial uh, X direct, there's substantial uh, ability to transfer uh, horizontal force in this connection. What about BY? Well, that's the same story. 
this uh, beam is able to carry a substantial shear load in the, uh, and it's just uh, from its own shape. Um, and there's whole sections in this, there's a whole chapter in the steel manual that you can learn how to, uh, they can apply to calculate the uh, shear stress or the shear strength of a, of a beam like this. Uh, the, the two uh, pins or the two uh, bolts, they're going to be capable of transferring substantial vertical force as well. And the weld will be able, and the plate will be able to substate, will be able to transfer substantial uh, vertical force, as will the weld, as will the column. Every component here is capable of transmitting substantial vertical force. And really, we need to think of this. Uh, now, I, I should be very careful when I say uh, substantial. What I'm really talking about is in the context of the strength of the member, and the context of the strength of this beam. So this beam, um, if you think about the capacities, the axial capacities, the uh, shear capacity, et cetera. Um, now, this tab is probably going to have, may, may have less shear, depending on the, depending on the relative thickness and strength. Uh, this tab is not going to have the exact same ultimate shear capacity as the web of this beam. However, they're going to be of similar magnitudes. Um, it's actually, this will probably, probably tend to be a bit higher. You probably size it so the connections are a bit stronger than the members themselves, depending on what kind of design you're doing. But uh, regardless, this, the shear capacity of each of these elements is going to be of similar capacity or of similar magnitude. But let's think about the moment. What about the moment? What kind of moment can we transfer through this? So again, um, in case you can't think of, if you, in case you're having trouble thinking of the shear um, capacity, let's just look, and, and also the moment, let's look at the, let's look at the cross sections of our plate and our beam here. Our connecting plate would have some sort of connect, would have some sort of cross section like this, while our beam would have some sort of cross section, a cross section that looked something like this. As is shown here, a wonderfully crudely drawn, a crudely drawn W section, and let's just call this one uh, for simplicity. I'll just call this one one, and this one two. So let's think about the ultimate shear capacity of each of these. Well, again, shear is going to be carried by uh, the web of a W section, and I see. Oh, and actually, I should probably draw this a little bit shorter than the. If I want to be consistent, I should probably draw this a little bit shorter than the, or below the flanges of the W section, just to make clear that this can fit right up against uh, this uh, web here. Because again, this plate is this plate. And this uh, W section is our beam here. So let's compare their shear strength. Now, our we can see that yes, the beam the beam will have a little bit uh, higher shear capacity than um, than our plate here, our connecting plate. So I would say yes, VU two is going to be greater than uh, VU one. In other words, the ultimate shear force of uh, uh, section two or call a uh, cross section two, our beam is going to be greater than um, VU one. However. In terms of order of magnitude, I would say that VU2 is going to be approximately equal to VU1, at least in terms of order of magnitude. I'm only talking about order of magnitude here. And then let's think about axial capacity. I would argue the same thing. I would say that PU1, uh, PU would be the ultimate uh, axial capacity is going to be approximately equal to PU2. Yes, the axial capacity of column two will in fact be greater than the axial capacity of one. I can almost guarantee it. However, they're going to be of similar orders of magnitude if this connection is designed to carry uh, that kind of force. So again, and how do I know that? Well, they have, well, um, if we ignore buckling for a moment, if we ignore uh, Euler column buckling, uh, the the axial capacity of a column is proportional to its cross-sectional area. And yes, this has a little bit more cross-sectional area because of the flanges, but they are of similar orders of magnitude. 
But what about moment? I would argue that MU2, the ultimate moment capacity of two, is much, much greater than MU1, the ultimate moment capacity of the plate. So yes, the plate will have, you know, from you can prove from basic mechanics that even a simple plate will have some um, moment capacity. But if we think back to statics and to mechanics and such, um, moment capacity comes from having area, from having large areas separated by a large distance. And that is effectively what a W section is intended to do. It is intended to have area very far, to maximize the amount of area very far from the neutral axis. And that's why you have this, a con, a, a, that is why a W section or an I beam is built the way it is. You have a flange, or sorry, you have a vertical web providing separation um, from two horizontal plates. And this basically maximizes the amount of area as far away from the neutral axis as possible. So yeah, this shape here, shape one, is very inefficient at carrying moment. Shape two is very efficient. So this has low moment efficiency. This has high moment, oh my God, tongue tied. This has high moment efficiency. So the moment capacity of two is not, it's not just simply, it's not just simply going to be a matter of cross-sectional area. Um, this probably has more cross-sectional area than this. Maybe it's, maybe this has 1.5 times the cross-sectional area of this, but it would not surprise me if this shape had 10 times the moment capacity of our uh, small uh, plate here. So what does that mean? Well, if I'm modeling this beam, if I'm modeling the support of this beam, what I would want to do is say, okay, well, relatively speaking, um, again, all of this is relatively speaking. This, mo this connection is not going to be able to carry substantial moment compared to the overall beam. So I would say that the moment, MB, is approximately zero. The moment capacity, not of the beam, but of the connection, is approximately zero. Everything we look at, in whenever we look at modeling supports, we're always taught playing a game of relative numbers. Yes, this connection does in reality have some moment capacity. However, its moment capacity compared to the beam that it's supporting is negligible. This, uh, this connection is limited by the moment capacity of this plate and the moment capacity of the, of the, of the shear force on each uh, bolt acting as a couple. Those, not, those capacities compared to the large moment capacity of the, or the massive moment capacity of the beam are negligible. And I mean, I don't know the exact number, but it's probably something on the order. It's probably like an order of magnitude greater. The moment capacity of the, the ultimate moment capacity of the beam is probably something like 10 times the moment capacity of this connection. And again, when doing any kind of real engineering, uh, we have to make models that simplify uh, complex structures and this is an example of that. So uh, I would say that the moment capacity of this connection is approximately zero. Next, let's look at the other end. Let's look at end A, where we have the beam simply resting on, the, uh, on a flat concrete surface. Uh, any, any questions before we continue? Right, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this. So now let's look at the other end of the beam. Uh, we just looked at end B, the right end of the beam. Now let's look at end A, the end that's simply resting on our concrete uh, pylon or concrete abutment or whatever, uh, however this might be designed. 
could be resting on a big concrete pylon or pillar or on a, a bridge abutment or something like that. And I like to put little dots on this to indicate this is concrete. Our wonderfully uh, rendered high-tech uh, visuals here. <laughs> anyway, so, and again, there is nothing actually connecting uh, this beam, now I, I drew it kind of floating, but in reality it's in direct contact. It's not levitating, I'm just drawing that so you can see the different surfaces. Um, but, so this beam is just literally just sitting on top of this uh, concrete. Uh, the steel beam is literally just resting directly on top of this concrete. There are no bolts running through, say, the flanges that, that you know, we don't have something like this where I'm running some bolts through the flange, uh, through the flange into the um, into the concrete block. Instead, it is literally doing nothing but simply bearing on that concrete surface. So let's redraw that, um, and then we will uh, investigate. So I wanna consider what kind of forces this connection is capable of transmitting. Well, first of all, let's investigate AY. Is it capable of transferring um, vertical force? I would say without a doubt, absolutely. This is much, much greater than zero. And because again, at least it is capable of doing so in one direction. It, yes, if I, if I try to lift this thing up, yes, then at that point there will be no, there will be no resisting it. Um, there will be no, there will be no uh, restraining force to resist it. But um, in terms of, uh, most load cases, uh, most load cases for this beam will probably be pushing this thing downward. And there is no way I'm going to be able to be, uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to push this uh, beam downward without forcing it through the concrete block. And so uh, if I, uh, the only way this beam is moving vertically is if I apply so much force uh, downward force on this beam that I actually break the concrete block. So, um, or maybe the, at that point, the uh, we'd have to do some math to figure out whether the steel uh, beam would break first or the concrete support. And we'd have to know more uh, information about the things like the uh, dimensions of each, the type of concrete, etc. But regardless, um, that is going to require a massive amount of force. What about in the X direction? Is this connection capable of transferring no lateral force, no horizontal force? I would say no. It is uh, it is capable of trans uh, transferring some force. I mean, have you ever uh, have you ever been riding a bike or uh, running down the sidewalk and tripped and fell or fall fallen off a bike? Um, you know what happens when you fall on concrete. You end up with a <laughs> you'll end up with a very bad um, you can end up with a very bad uh, skid burn, uh, whatever you want to, might want to call it. And where does that come from? Well. The surface of concrete is not smooth glass. It is in fact a very rough, very tough surface. And in fact, we deliberately created that way. We want concrete to have lots of friction because that's what allows uh, shoes and tires and bicycle tires and car wheels and everything else to provide gription on the surface. Uh, if concrete didn't, if a concrete surface didn't have a, a large, uh, a decent amount of friction, then we wouldn't uh, use it for road surfaces. Um, so concrete does have a lot of amount of friction. And that means if we have a downward force, we're also going to have a decent amount of friction um, on the beam or on the surface here. So that means there is some friction, there is some uh, capacity. So if I have a downward force, there's going to be some coefficient of friction between these two surfaces. And because of that, if I try to pull this thing this way, even ignoring the connection here and that restraint provided by that, there is going to be some lateral resistance or horizontal resistance provided just by the uh, friction between the concrete and the steel. However, we need to always remember that we're looking at this and when we're modeling structures, we need to think about things in, in relative terms compared to the actual, okay. So yes, it's going to take some force to make this, uh, if I am holding, imagine I'm holding this beam on the other end, instead of a column, I'm just holding it. I'm going to have to apply some horizontal force to get that thing moving. But am I going, is that frictional force going to be so great that the steel beam will snap in half before, uh, before this actually starts sliding? 
No, of course not. I don't care uh, how great the the, the uh, uh, coefficient of friction is, uh, unless there's something like a structural adhesive or some uh, incredibly strong glue or really a weld joining some, somehow joining this to another steel plate below it or something. Unless I actually have some substantial connection, that horizontal force is going to be negligible. So that AX force is no longer really in question. Again, that horizontal force compared to the amount of horizontal force this beam can actually transfer is negligible. So I would say that AX is approximately zero. All right, what else? What about the moment? What about the moment at A? So I have my AX, which again is approximately zero. A Y is much greater than zero. What about the moment at A, which I'll just refer to as MA? What about that? Leave that arrow off. What about MA? Well, is this capable of transmitting some amount of moment? Um, if I thought about it for a while, let's see. Um, this thing, if you, now, if you have a perfectly flat, okay, so we're gonna model these as point forces, but in reality, every force, uh, every bearing force is not going to be a point force. It's going to be more of an, a, a small area force, a small area load. It bears on a surface. Load, load, point loads, of course, don't actually exist. If you had a point load, um, if you had a true point load, there would be no resisting it. It would have, uh, a, a point load would have infinite pressure underneath it. So if I apply, if I apply, a, if my pinky finger could apply a point load to a giant uh, steel beam, giant piece of uh, plate steel, I could puncture that. If I could actually generate a true point load, imagine this, uh, board were, were uh, steel instead of acrylic. Uh, if my pinky finger were capable of generating a true point load, I could pierce that steel uh, steel plate just by the slightest of pressure uh, or the slightest of force because a true point load would have zero area that it's applied over, which means it would have infinite pressure. No material can withstand infinite pressure because uh, no material has infinite uh, yield stress or infinite ultimate stress. So every th when we model things as point loads, uh, in reality, they are, um, they are actually area or pressure loads, and we are simply approximating them. And that's, that is actually another type of engineering approximation where we approximate uh, when a load is applied over an area that is small relative to the area of the member that it's on, then we can approximate it as a point load. But Let's look at this. Uh, let's look at the bearing between the uh, between the beam and the concrete pile on here. So, if I have something like this, where there is uh, there is no, where there's a nice uniform force, no problem. There's not going to be any moment transferred. But as you start getting into more exotic types of loading, what if the loading is not? Um, what if the loading is not uniform? What if you have something more like this. Hmm. I don't want to get too much into the statics, but when you start combining it, when you, uh, when you start combining a non-uniform load, especially if you combine that with some sort of, um, let's see if you just, uh, some sort of uh, slight uh, other, slight tilting force or reaction force against the corner here, uh, there's probably some way using that connection to actually get some very small amount of moment out of that connection. And I'd have to think a little bit more about how to do that, but I'm pretty sure you could actually get some small amount of moment from that if you were really creative. But again, we're talking about, you know, uh, slight, slight moments that might result from tiny little moment arms that result from inconsistent uh, loadings across the surface. So it you probably could get some very, very small amount of moment out of that but it's going to be negligible compared to the moment, the moment capacity of the beam itself. So I would say the moment capacity is approximately zero. Again, everything we're doing here is, is relative. We're looking at the capacity of this connection, and again, this bearing type connection, relative to the beam that we're considering. 
So we now know that uh, connection, uh, connection B has substantial horizontal capacity and substantial vertical capacity and uh, approximately or at least relatively uh, small amounts of moment capacity. And we know connection A has substantial vertical capacity, but relatively very little horizontal and moment capacity. So let's consider what that looks like. Let's sum this up by looking at what that or considering what that looks like in terms of our models that we considered previously. All right, so we know that end A is capable of transferring a horizontal force and a vertical force, or sorry, and uh, A is only capable of a uh, vertical force, sorry about that. We know that end A is only capable of transferring a substantial vertical force even though we know that yes, it is does have some small capacity in the other uh, in the other directions, and then end B is capable of transferring substantial force both both horizontally and vertically. So this should look familiar. This should look familiar uh, relative to something we looked at previously, and. Remember what we looked at last time, our idealized connections. I see a connection here that, can, that is only capable of transferring substantial amounts of force in one direction. To me, that looks a lot like a pin, or sorry, a roller. Getting ahead of myself. This looks a lot like a roller connection. Again, you can recall that the definition of a roller connection is one that is capable of transmitting uh, that is one that is capable of transmitting uh, translational force in one and only in one and only one direction. So I would say this is a, this can be a, so. In other words, this end of the beam here can be approximated as a roller support. And B, however, is capable of, is not capable of resisting moment or substantial moment anyway but it is capable of resisting substantial horizontal and vertical force. In other words, it's capable of resisting substantial force in two translational directions. And I have a connection for that. I have a connection model for that. And that is our pin connection, like so. Again, the definition of a pin connection is one that is capable, or a pin connection or a pin support, is one that is capable of transmitting uh, translational force in two directions, but not capable of transferring substantial moment. So I would approximate uh, end B as a, uh, uh, as a pin connection. Or maybe just a pin support to be, to be consistent. So if I were then to model this beam from a structural uh, line element perspective, I would draw the beam something like this. I would simply have a roller at one end and a pin at the other. And that is what, that is, uh, this is the, these are the kind of approximations we use when modeling um, real structures. Yes, there are always, these are, we are making certain assumptions. We are making certain approximations. Uh, as we've seen, uh, each one of these supports, both end A and end B, are capable of transmitting some small amount of all three of the forces, uh, trans, uh, ex, uh, horizontal translational force or just horizontal force 
vertical force, and moment. Each of them are capable of transmitting some very small amounts of that. But again, in relative terms, um, and A is going to act as a roller support and and B is going to act as a pin support. And that is the process that we use. Those kinds of tools are what we use when we uh, create structural models. Yes, they are not perfect. No engineering model is. We are making certain uh, certain educated uh, approximations, and, but we need to do that in order to, to uh, again, the whole idea of an engineering model is that the real world is incredibly complex. Real structures are incredibly complex and there are, there is no, it is not physically possible to model them to perfect precision. There is always, there are always going to be some, uh, some unknown variables, unless you have the ability to, if you really want to be technical, unless you have the ability to like literally model a structure in terms of one atom at a time, one atom at a time. So you have some impossibly powerful supercomputer or something, a supercomputer as big as the universe or something, you're always going to need to make some approximations in your structural analysis. Now, maybe if you can, again, maybe if you can model an entire building atom by atom, maybe then you don't, don't need to make so many approximations, but uh, we are far, far away from anything like that. So that's neither here nor there. Okay. Stru uh, questions on approximating um, structural supports, and there are other there are other approximations you can do. You can also make up uh, models for uh, concrete connections uh, when you're joining one concrete element to another, wood connections, etc. Uh, wood connections, wood supports, etc. So we have seen what a pinned or a roller support would look like for steel. Uh, for the sake of completion, what would this look? I want to look at what this would look like for. Uh, a fixed connection for steel or a fixed support. Well, recall again for the uh, pin support, uh, because the web carries the majority of the shear, if we want to create a pin support, we simply connect only the web of a, uh, of a steel W section. But what if we want a fixed support in steel? How would we approximate that? Well, we simply need to join not only the flan uh, not only the web, but also the flanges. And there are many, many, many different ways of connect of uh, of creating steel connections. That's an entire uh, field uh, field of design. And in fact, there are entire companies that do nothing but make proprietary steel connections, especially for really uh, especially for specialty cases like high seismic regions. The connections for those, um, and you can take. Uh, you can take entire graduate level courses in nothing more than steel connection design. So I'm just going to illustrate one of them right here. Uh, just And it's not going to be a scale or anything, just to illustrate the basic principle. So again, uh, we know for steel, for a W section as we looked at, the majority of the shear is carried by the web and most of the flexure is carried by the flanges. So if we want to carry just shear and axial force, all we need is this shear tap, or if we, in other words, all we need is a plate joining the, uh, that's, that's bothering me, that is way too narrow. So let's make it more like this here. And maybe it's, it could be bolted or it could be welded, whatever. So, and the reason I'm, now I have drawn, it looks like I've redrawn the pin connection. And in some ways I have, and, and, also, don't mistake this as meaning that uh, this has to be bolted and this has to be welded. Um, you could have both of them welded, you could have both of them bolted. Again, there are numerous ways to design a steel connection. So, what I have basically drawn is the same pin connection I had before. Um, and again, this plate here is capable of transmitting a substantial lateral, and a horizontal and vertical force, but not moment. So how do I transmit moment? Well, I simply need to connect up the flanges. And to do that, I could add a few more plates. I could add a top plate and a bottom plate and probably weld that, probably weld that. And I could put a couple bolts like this and a couple bolts like this. So the key, again, I don't want to get too deeply, too deep into steel design here. But if I, but the key here is that if I want to have both, if I want to be able to transmit both 
um, horizontal, if I wanna be able to transmit all three, horizontal force, vertical force, and moment uh, through my connection uh, in steel, joining this beam to this column, I need to engage and connect both the, uh, the web and the flanges of this steel beam. And that is one method, at least, of creating a fixed support um, in a steel system. Also, I would like to briefly explore uh, how pinned rollers and fixed connections, uh, how these idealized models would be represented in, say, reinforced concrete. So, a, let's look at, we don't, we don't need to go through the entire uh, breakdown of forces like we looked at previously, but let's see what a roller connection would look like in reinforced concrete. A roller connection again must only be able to cow, uh, must only be capable of transmitting a force in a single translational direction. So let's say we had something like this, where you have a concrete beam simply resting on a concrete pier or column, like this. And these would be in direct physical contact, not just uh, floating on top of each other. Obviously, maybe you have a break line here. And so this if, if we have a concrete beam simply resting on a column or a pier or abutment or whatever it may be, we'll have the same type of uh, connection that we looked at previously for steel or the same type of behavior as we looked at previously with the steel connection, where this is capable of transmitting substantial vertical force, but very little horizontal force or moment. Now, what would a moment connection look like? Um, let's say we have a beam or a column and, and both, let's say both of these are concrete. And it's important to remember, now it's, uh, if you're not familiar, concrete is going to have, um, concrete is capable of ca uh, carrying compressive stress, but it is not capable of carrying substantial tensile stress. So we reinforce it with, so we reinforce it with rebar, steel reinforcement or rebar. And this would be present in both the beam and the column. Now, if I want to have a fixed connection, what I will do is I will have my rebar uh, from the beam extending and joining into the rebar of the column. And now this, is, this isn't exactly <laughs> proper detailing, but I'm just trying to give the basic premise. Um, what I could do is I could have my rebar extending out and then interfacing and engaging closely with the rebar uh, of the uh, of the column. So in other words, the there is a con there is continuity between the rebar of the beam and rebar of the column, and this would be capable of transmitting um, substantial moment. The the moment carrying uh, elements of the column are firmly engaged with the moment carrying elements of the beam or of the beam and of su and as such this would represent a f a fixed connection between a uh, a concrete column and a concrete uh, beam so this would be a fixed connection again in concrete uh, in concrete And I'm sure we could think of a uh, some method of doing a. Now it is it is a bit. I will mention it's a bit trickier to do pin connections as concrete. Um, you usually don't aim to have pin connections as concrete. If you want to do that, um, when you consider the uh, when you consider the type of oh the type of forces that are carried in a concrete element, it's very difficult to get a pure concrete pin connection. So if you wanted to do a pin connection with concrete, you would have to do something a little more exotic. So you might be able to have something like this. So you might have some sort of, oh, you could have your concrete column resting on some sort of steel plate. Maybe like a, maybe an angle section, for example. So maybe it's Maybe the connection from the side would look like this, with your column like this, like so, and maybe there'd be some bolts or threaded rod extending into the column from our two angles here. So maybe I'll draw this as a pair of angles instead of a single plate. And well, 
yeah, so I'll, I'll have my flange of my angle, and then this, and this, and this in turn would be able to count, this then would be able to transfer substantial force horizontally and vertically, but it would not be able to transmit substantial force um, in moment, at least about this axis here. So if you really want a pin connection with concrete, you can get it, but you're gonna, you're probably going to have to create, if you want to, if you want a pin support with concrete, you may have to create this kind of exotic uh, connection detail like this. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't consider this also for this, for the, uh, or from the point of view of wood design. So let's look at wood design. Let's say I want to connect a wooden beam to a wooden column. So I have a wooden column. Maybe I'll draw some lines on it to indicate a uh, grain direction. And another one here. Another beam here. And I'll go ahead and draw out the uh, some lines to indicate grain direction as well. Although that's not going to be too important for our discussion here. This is not a wood design class. But I thought I would just go ahead and illustrate this for the sake of completion. Now to join these two together, let's say you have a, oh, maybe you just use an angle iron to join the two together, like so, and maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger, actually. Something like this. And maybe there's a, a flange here and there would be some bolts going into the column and there would then we would then want some bolts also going into the beam so depending on how i arrange these bolts uh, i will get either a I actually make let me make this a bit larger so i have some more room to work so let's say so this is not going to be to scale i'm drawing at the scale i am just for the sake of illustration purposes and i'll go ahead and make this maybe even a little bit longer like so so I have a big plate, basic, and uh, from above, if I was looking down on this beam, I would have my beam going upward like that, if I were looking above, and then I would have my column, and actually maybe the column would be a bit bigger maybe, if I was going to have uh, what I'm showing here. So let's say I have my column here, my connection would be a series of plates like that, or a series of uh, angles like this. There'd be one on each side um, for probably torsional stability, but they would uh, exist there. And so again, they would be bolted to the column, and then I'll have some number of bolts, some arrangement of bolts, also joining them to the wooden beam. So how do I get a pin or a roller connection? And the problem with this is that the real problem with this is that if I'm just drawing this as like a, a mass timber type system, the beam, if I look at the cross-sectional area of the beam, the beam cross-section would look something like this. It's just a rectangle. Well, maybe it might have rounded over edges or such, and there might be some local defects and that kind of thing, but its cross-section is going to be approximately rectangular. So we're not going to have that nice breakdown of flanges and web where we said, oh, we said, uh, in, like with the steel, we said that the uh, we can assume that the web carries all the shear and the uh, flanges carry all the moment. So we had a very easy way of, of creating a pin or a fixed connection simply based on how we arranged our, or what elements we engaged and connected. But what about something like this where we have a simple rectangular section? Well, one way to do that is we, if we if we want to induce certain behavior in this, uh, we can we can force a pin or a roller or a pin or a fixed connection depending on how we lay out the bolts. So um, again, this is going to be bolted to the column. But if I want a pin or a fixed connection um, on the end of this beam, I will get that depending on how I lay the bolts out. So a pinned connection could look something like this. So I have my angles. What I might do is something like this. Imagine using a single roll of, a uh, single, uh, not roll, a single row of bolt holes, bolts going into uh, into the wood, etc. 
perhaps even penetrate, and these might even penetrate all the way through, and there might just be some big giant bolts going from one to the other, depending on how we do the connection. But, uh, or they could be screws going into the wood and not all the way through, just again, depending on how we choose to design it. But the pinned connection, if I, if I want to produce a pinned connection, I might do something like this. So notice all of my bolts are in one single row. And because of that, there's not, if I try to bend it, if, I, if I'm applying bending like this, there's not going to be substantial, um, there's not going to be substantial uh, engagement in order to create a moment capacity. There's no, if I want to resist a moment in the direction of the beam, I need to have some sort of force like this and like this. And that's not going to happen now. We would have to worry about maybe perhaps getting some sort of moment like this, but depending on how you space them, you may be able to avoid that. Um, so the key is we wouldn't want to have them separated by very large distances. So I would tend to have fewer connection, or fewer uh, bolts. Um, although generally with wood design, you want to have uh, m larger numbers of small uh, of smaller diameter connectors. So I wouldn't want to just have a single bolt, and that would that would produce a true pin connection. But I would, basically I would want to work as hard as I can to minimize the moment arms between my uh, my bolts, and with that I will then be able to. Um, with that, I will then be able to resist uh, a large amounts of shear and axial force, but not a uh, moment. Although it's going to be difficult to exactly get a pin connection. So if you wanted to get a true pin, um, again, that would be a little bit tricky. The fix is going to be a little easier. Here, we could simply have our, uh, our bolts separated by large distances and those large distances, so we'd have the bolts going into the column, and they might have something like this. Although even this is not necessarily best practice, but that's neither here nor there, and because of shrinkage and creep with wood, but that's beyond the scope of this course. So I would have, uh, I would have my bolts positioned at the top and the bottom of the plate, and thus I would be capable of transmitting substantial forces. I would not only be able to get capable, I would not only be capable of transmitting substantial forces, I would be have a set of forces that were separated by a large moment arm, and that would provide my large uh, moment capacity. So if I wanted to, um, so yeah, maybe you could have something kind of like this, where your bolts are separated by relatively small distances. Although I'd have to think about whether this is true. Now let me think about that. Is that actually capable of transmitting substantial moment? I think it probably could if you think about it from the basic from basic mechanics. Although it wouldn't be very efficient because you'd have to, you'd be transmitting this all at the neutral axis of the beam. So I think even if you just did a single row of bolts like that, even with some decently large spaces, if it was near the center of the beam, you wouldn't be getting, um, you wouldn't be having substantial, uh, substantial moment uh, couple forces at the top and the bottom of the beam, which is what you really need if you want to transfer moment from the beam to the column. All right, and then finally, what about a roller support on wood? Well, this is going to be the simplest, just like every, just like uh, our when we've looked at steel and concrete. The roller support is always the simplest, and that can be produced just by, if you have a beam here, we can simply rest it on top of something. So it could be bearing directly on top of, the col of a column like this, with maybe our grain going in this direction. Or maybe on the other end, we could show another way of doing this. I might have some sort of hanger. Imagine having some sort of support or hanger and then the column uh, was supporting the hanger. Showing some grain lines there. And this is again, not going to be, so maybe this would be bolted. So I can have like an angle and it was just resting on top of the angle. And so there would be, there would probably, there would need to be bolts joining the angle to the, uh, let me make that more of an angle rather than some weird <laughs> boomerang shape. Like so. So maybe it's bolted to the column and it's simply resting on top of the angle and that will be capable of resisting substantial vertical force, but it will not be capable of resisting uh, substantial lateral force or substantial moment. And that's how you would create a pin, a roller, and a fixed support uh, in wood design. All right, that concludes our look at idealized connection types. 
Again, we've looked at how to approximate pinned, roller, and fixed connections in three primary civil engineering materials, steel, concrete, and wood structural elements. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. If not, I hope to see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.